And thank you everyone for joining us today. We are excited to have you along on this virtual tour. As much as we normally love doing our in-person tours throughout the state and particularly our overnighter that we've done in the past for Capital Staff, uh, this year, obviously, it wasn't in the cards, but uh, it's a great opportunity to highlight the healthcare activities that special districts do in communities throughout the state. And no better presenters to talk about that than the three presenters we have today from Mayor's Memorial Hospital District, from Desert Healthcare District down in the Coachella Valley, and from Shasta Mosquito and Vector Control District. We are very excited to have them here today. I can tell you they're very knowledgeable. They're experts in the field. And I hope that you will all learn something about the healthcare industry and the uh, mosquito abatement challenges that our state and really the world faces and how important those small little critters are and the abatement of them uh, to our health and to preventing future epidemics in our state. Um, but before we get there uh, to the exciting part and your all-star presenter list, I want to take a brief moment and give a short overview of special districts so that you can know how all of this work is done, why these specialists exist, why they are serving our communities. And so if you'll bear with me for one moment, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I will do a little overview for you. Now, if you had the opportunity to participate in one of our previous tours and you have seen this presentation, please know that I'm gonna bring it to you live and hopefully I will give you a few new insights from what you heard before, but I'm gonna also keep it brief uh, so that you can get to the meat of what you're all looking for today. So what is a special district? Well, the best way to describe what a special district is, is to talk about what they do and they provide specialized services. And they do this not just here in California, but actually throughout the entire country. Uh, you've probably heard of water districts, maybe even fire protection districts. Uh, today, you're gonna hear from healthcare districts and mosquito abatement districts. There are also library, cemetery, utility, uh, resource conservation. There are special districts in most of the major categories of the essential services that our communities depend on. And they provide those services in communities that don't otherwise receive those services from a city or a county. But they do this, as you can see, at high levels to millions of people in our state and across the country, 40% of utilities, 15% of fire protection, a third of healthcare, much of our parks and recreation, so again, these are the essential services. They're services that are provided at the local level. And when provided by special districts, they're provided with a specialization in that area. And I hope that through today's presentation, you'll see a little bit about the value of that, why they do that. Um, they exist both in incorporated and unincorporated areas. So they do overlap with cities in some cases, but when they do overlap with cities, there are not competing services. They don't have, uh, they don't provide the same service as the city. They provide a service that the city isn't providing. Um, they do exist in populations, both large and small, urban and rural. Generally in the urban coastal areas of the state, they tend to be more regional in nature, um, providing economies of scale, providing ex expertise and specialization over multiple cities or sometimes even multiple counties. And in rural areas, there are sometimes neighborhoods uh, that have a particular need that that neighborhood wants, wants done well, wants done with local control. So again, they deliver specialized services. That's why special is in the name. It's not because we think we're special. It's because that's what we do is we specialize. And most of those services involve a large amount of critical infrastructure, um, particularly when it comes to water and wastewater, but also sometimes natural infrastructure, such as with resource conservation or regional parks or open space. And we're seeing more and more the value of that with climate change and climate adaptation and the need to adapt. Uh, employ, they employ first responders and essential workers. Virtually everyone that works for a special district uh, is essential because of the nature of the service that they're proposing or that they're delivering, as well as many of our state's first responders, particularly firefighters, but also some law enforcement officers and other first responders providing those emergency services during disasters uh, during emergencies such as what we're experiencing with COVID-19. 
There are 30,000 special districts across the United States, according to the US Census Bureau, and there's about 2,000 independent special districts right here in California. Special districts are local governments created by the people. Uh, legally, technically speaking, they are subdivisions of the state of California, just like cities are. So if you look in statute, that's how they'll be referred to as subdivisions of the state. And they're authorized in state statute through what we call enabling acts. So how are they created? They're formed through a public process. Most of the time, that process goes through the Local Agency Formation Commission or the LAFCO. Uh, sometimes that process will happen directly through the state legislature. There's about 140 of the 2000 special districts that were formed directly through the state legislature. I like to say that those special districts are so special that they needed a special act through the state legislature. They are owned and overseen by the community. That's very important. These are the community's uh, government, right? They are formed by them, they are uh, funded by them, and they are overseen by them through a public board of directors. Most of the time, that board of directors is elected, um, as you will see from a couple of our districts here today. And sometimes it's appointed, but to a fixed term. And by that, I mean that that's not just the city council or the board of supervisors that serves ex officio or that appoints their staff to serve at the pleasure of the city council or the board of supervisors. These are professionals, sometimes experts in the field, such as doctors or biologists or those sorts of things, engineers that get appointed to a fixed term of four years to make decisions on behalf of the community. And they make those decisions independently and control an independent budget and independent staff from any other form of government. That's a smaller percentage of those independent special districts. It's typically your mosquito abatement districts and your public cemetery districts. Um, they all have to abide by the state's various sunshine laws, the Brown Act for open and public meetings, the California Public Records Act, bidding laws and regulations, prevailing wage, uh, all the different departments of the state, whether it's the state water board or the health department or OSHA or OSHPID, et cetera, all of the alphabet soups uh, they need to abide by, as well as LAFCOs that do municipal service re services reviews. Um, they all do regular financial audits. They all post their compensation to the state controller's office website. They post financial transaction reports. There is a lot of oversight, but the best oversight really comes from the public, from the people, from the community that elects their boards, that pays their taxes and their rates, and that can attend all of their open and public meetings. And we like to believe that special districts are some of, if not the most local form of government, and they can be the most accessible and responsive. For one, you don't need to raise a million dollars to get elected to a special district board. And so it provides access to even serve on the board and oversee the special district. Uh, for number two, if you go to a special district board meeting, which is likely right in your backyard, or if you bump into a member at a grocery store, um, when you talk about the specific issue that that special district serves that they focus on, you talk about the playground in the park on Watt and Hurley, right? And that board member, that general manager is gonna know that playground in specific detail. They're, they're, they might even know the slide or the swing, right? Um, versus a general purpose government covering a wide swath of area that's got many, many competing crises and issues going on. They're just not going to be able to have that level of focus and specialization that level of accessibility and responsiveness on these essential issues that matter to people. They might not matter all the time, but when it counts, they matter. A history of special districts. Uh, the story of special districts actually really helps to explain what they are and who they are. The first special district in California was formed in 1887. It was the Turlock Irrigation District. Make a long story short, group of farmers say, hey, we actually worked together, all pitched in some money. We'd be willing to do that in order to give us all better reliable water for our crops, right? And if we're willing to pay that money, pay those taxes, pay those fees, if we can elect the board, have local oversight, ensure that they're doing the things that we want them to do in a prudent fashion. And so they created the Turlock Irrigation District, which exists to this day. Um, the number of special districts expanded greatly after World War II with the baby boom lots of population expansion, lots of expansion throughout the state, lots of need for nimble service creation and delivery. Special districts filled that void. In the 1970s, you see a stabling off in terms of the number of special districts. That's due to Proposition 13 limiting revenue, as well as the formation of 
local agency formation commissions um, that control growth and control the development of new agencies, um, do consolidations, do reorganizations, et cetera, which has been a good thing because it's allowed special districts to continue to evolve and better serve their communities, a population growth of 20% since the 90s. Meanwhile, the number of special districts has actually gone down by 5%, yet they're still serving that, that large population. They, they do continue to evolve with the community's needs. There are special districts formed every year, there are special districts dissolved every year, and there are special districts reorganized or consolidated every year throughout the state. Their funding comes from two sources. Um, usually most special districts get both what we call enterprise revenue from various fees and rates, as well as non-enterprise revenue from things like property taxes, assessments, et cetera. Overall, they receive about 8% of the state's property tax base, which is a very small percentage when you think of the number of people that they're serving, the amount of services they're provided. Um, what's important to know about non-enterprise and enterprise revenues is that while you have water districts, et cetera, utility districts that primarily rely on enterprise revenues, and perhaps uh, uh, recreation of park districts and fire protection districts that primarily, primarily rely on property tax, that diverse revenue portfolio matters in times like this with a pandemic where you have emergencies, where you need reserves. It matters in times of drought. It matters in times of developing infrastructure and ensuring that infrastructure is sustained and available in good times and in bad. I already talked a little bit about independent and dependent, but I do want to explain the difference uh, again briefly is that a dependent special district basically serves at the pleasure of another body. And so they're kind of like a subunit of that agency. They're still a special district. They still specialize in their service. They just don't have the same level of autonomy over the control of their decisions and their finances, et cetera. And so to conclude, I just want to conclude by saying that at the end of the day, if you remember one thing about special districts is that they are local service specialists. So they're formed and owned by the community. They're designed to meet a specific need. That's why they're formed and that's what they do. They focus on doing one thing and doing that one thing efficiently and effectively as best they can, thinking long-term, thinking sustainably because of that focus, much like a business might do. And finally, they hire and employ specialists and oftentimes their boards are made up of specialists as well who are passionate about the community and passionate about that particular type of service that they're providing. And I'd like to conclude with one pitch for you, one takeaway, and we are in the middle of a pandemic. And while state, county, and city governments have received uh, uh, relief funding from the federal government and from the state of California, special districts generally have not. They have not received direct access to relief funding like cities and counties. And so despite the fact that these communities are receiving this one community is receiving the services from a city or county and another community is receiving it from a special district. Those communities receiving uh, services from special districts are not receiving that relief funding in the same way. Um, we're employing first responders and essential workers who we are having to furlough, in some cases having to lay off, and the future could get worse depending on how the pandemic goes, how it affects things like property taxes, et cetera. And so we'd like everyone's consideration to address that. And we have federal legislation to try to address that. And we are working at the state level as well. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will be introducing our first uh, presentation, which is going to be coming from Mayor's Memorial Hospital District. But before we do, we wanna give just a brief topic overview. And to do that, I'm going to introduce first CSDA's Senior Legislative Representative, Dylan Gibbons. Dylan, please take it away. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Uh, for those of you I haven't already met with, my name is Dylan Gibbons, and I'm CSDA's Senior Legislative Representative. I've been with CSDA a little over five years, and prior to that, I worked in the legislature for over a decade. In addition to covering employment law and general governance issues, I cover health care and mosquito vector control issues for CSDA. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to working with you all in the future. Back to you, Kyle. Thank you, Dylan, on your picnic blanket in front of the Capitol I see there. And now I'm going to turn it on over to our good friend and uh, great partner, Amber King of the Association of California Healthcare Districts, who's partnering with CSDA today on this tour. Amber? Thank you, Kyle. Uh, yes, as Kyle said, Amber King with the Association of California Healthcare Districts. 
I have been fortunate enough to represent healthcare districts for almost 15 years. And um, I am very proud, especially in these times of how our healthcare districts have really stepped up during this pandemic. Uh, a little bit about healthcare districts. There are 77 healthcare districts throughout the state, all the way from the um, northern border, all the way down to the ne Mexican border from the coast, uh, all the way to the mountain ranges. So healthcare districts are um, vast in um, the services that they provide as well. So um, the, there are various types of healthcare districts, primarily hospital and community-based districts is how we talk about them. We have very large uh, trauma care medical centers all the way down to very small rural critical access facilities. And then there are many different types of districts in between. So we do have standalone skilled nursing facility districts, standalone um, clinics, standalone ambulance services, we have many other districts that provide community health and wellness programs. And um, really the healthcare districts fill the health gaps of the communities that they serve. And so you'll hear, hear today from two very different districts and how they serve their community's health needs as well as how they have stepped up during this pandemic. So with uh, that, thank you all for being here today and learning about healthcare districts. And I will turn it back to Kyle. Thank you, Amber. Now, by the magic of Zoom, we're going to head off to the northern border that Amber mentioned and take a brief tour of the Mayor's Memorial Hospital District. Enjoy the video. Located in northeastern Shasta County, tucked between Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta, is one of California's rural critical access hospitals. Mayor's Memorial Hospital District has been serving the Intermountain community's healthcare needs since 1956. In the 60 years Mayor's has served our area, we have continuously strived to improve the quality of healthcare we provide. The hospital is the lifeblood of our communities in this region. Having access to a local hospital providing emergency as well as essential medical services in our remote area are among a community's most important resources. Mayors is also proud to be a significant part of our economic vitality as the area's largest employer with over 220 employees. Always caring, always here are four words Mayors has emphasized over the years in their commitment to provide quality care. Mayors is excited to announce the grand opening of our brand new facility wing that offers a seismically safe, state-of-the-art space which will be home to our emergency, imaging, and lab departments. Mayors has been fortunate to have tremendous community support over the years in each step of growth. Statewide, local and regional institutions and many individuals chose to be a part of this remarkable project and invested in the community's well-being. Together, we are saving lives and creating a healthier community. Our community has proven time and time again that it supports the mission of Mayors and values the contributions it makes to the quality of life in our region. Our capital campaign committee worked hard to reach and exceed the $3 million campaign goal for the project. It's through the generosity demonstrated during this campaign that showcases how much our community cares about this beautiful place we all call home. With a million dollar grant from the McConnell Foundation and over $250,000 in donations by mayors employees themselves, mayors believes that our community is the backbone of our success. As a critical access hospital, the emergency department is an essential service. Over the years, the need for patient capacity in the emergency department at Mayors has steadily increased. We've moved from a one room, one bed ED to this spacious emergency department with private rooms, updated equipment, and increased space for critical patients. The new space was designed to comply with regulations and changes while providing the best workflow and patient experience possible. All licensed emergency departments offer laboratory and radiologic services depending on their level of licensure. As time is important in an emergency, it is important to have these services located close to each other in order to obviate rapid patient assessments. These facilities are able to work together for both adequate patient evaluations and subsequent care. This new building was designed to incorporate this as well as expand services in each department with new, modernized equipment. 
Mayers continues to strive for improving quality and patient satisfaction, and we are excited to have new and improved tools to do so in adequate spaces specifically designed for the appropriate areas of care. Well, while you may not be able to get the full feel of all the infrastructure and the facilities of a special district through a virtual tour, I think that you're going to be able to see the heart of special districts by hearing from the specialists serving in them. And that's what I want, how I want to introduce Ms. Valerie Lakey. Uh, please take it away, Valerie. Thank you, Kyle. What you just saw was literally years of planning and a lot of hard work to bring our district into compliance with the 1994's SB 1953. And we're very, very proud of this building and the importance it is to our community. I was really excited and found it pretty interesting to be involved in this tour as my husband is actually a board member on a mosquito district. So a little bit of a fit there. But um, my role here at Mayor's Memorial Hospital District is the Director of Community Relations and Business Development and the Emergency Preparedness Coordinator. In a small district, many of us wear a lot of hats. Um, there's a lot of things that we all do, which makes our, our job very, very diverse and I think help, will help me to give you a pretty broad overview of what we do here at Mayor's. As you saw in the video, we are very, very rural. We live, um, we're in Northeastern Shasta County. We're a critical access hospital. And we also have a frontier hospital designation, which means that we serve a population of less than 11 people per square mile. And obviously we are a district and we're very proud to be a certified healthcare district, meaning that we meet all of the requirements of district transparency through the certification program. Our district area is about 4,000 square miles. But in addition to that, we serve another 4,000 square miles of outlying areas of a population that is not in our taxpayer base. The nearest hospitals to us are 75 miles any direction you go. So we are pretty much it in this rural area. And we provide services ranging from acute to emergency department to respiratory care, physical therapy, cardiac rehab, wound care, a lot of different services that provide our local residents some of the, the necessities that they need and allow them to not travel out of the area to get these services. Our district is growing, which we're very excited about. In fact, we are currently a hospital district, but we will be changing to a healthcare district. We've opened a new retail pharmacy we were a hospital that was one of the few with no clinics, and we will be opening a new clinic in the spring of 2021. And as you saw, we have the new hospital wing, which meets all of our seismic requirements and houses our emergency department, imaging, lab, and lobby. This was um, really made possible through some efforts from some of our uh, members down in Sacramento, Assemblyman then, Brian Daly, sponsored legislation, AB 1290, to get us the design build legislation, which helped us to get this project done in a more efficient manner. But about the hospital, we're, we're more than just a hospital. We are a cornerstone in our community. You heard in the video that we are the largest employer in Northeastern Shasta County, and we are the seventh largest employer in all of Shasta County. We have a $12 million payroll, a $22.9 million economic return to our community. And beyond that, we are often looked towards for education and guidance in not only healthcare, but in community planning and most recently emergency preparedness. A very good example of that is the COVID response. And I know that's a topic for everyone, but Mayors has been very proactive in our approach to COVID. We've taken a lead in our community with messaging and education. We partnered with local school districts to help them with their COVID planning and the implementation of their procedures to keep their students and their staff safe. And we've just really worked on trying to provide accurate information to the members of our district. We always try to look for positives in any situation. And one of those was 
becoming more collaborative with our county, with public health, the sheriff's department, and other agencies. We do have a few challenges here in the district, and one of them I would say is really comes from the diversity of the state and the fact that there's not a one-size-fits-all solution for all of the different challenges that healthcare faces. An example would be the 2030 seismic requirements that are coming our way. So in a rural district, we have more um, our limited finances, resources, staff, and some just different issues that are hard for us to meet some of the regulatory mandates. Um, I really appreciate the opportunities such as this to help people learn about who we are and what we do. It was a broad overview, and I know I'm out of time. So I, I um, am going to, there goes my timer. I'm going to wrap it up here and just tell you that we always welcome questions and visits and let you know that mayors is really a great picture and a representation of how a small rural district can work together with other districts and businesses and organizations to make sure that we can provide resources that are very necessary to a small community. Thank you so much, Valerie. And if any of you do have questions, because there's a lot of important issues raised there, please go ahead and chat them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end of the tour. So look forward to Valerie being able to answer some of those questions as well as our other presenters. And Valerie brought up an important issue that is of the diversity of our state and the diversity of our special districts in meeting the specific specialized needs of such a diverse state. And so we're gonna move now from the Northern part of California all the way down to the very Southern part of California into the Coachella Valley of Riverside County with a desert healthcare district. Enjoy your tour. The Desert Healthcare District was founded in 1948 to build a hospital in Palm Springs, California. In 1997, the district's board leased the hospital to Tenet Health. Since 1997, we have become more of a healthcare foundation that works collaboratively with so many organizations, from uh, being a hospital-centric organization to being a community-centric organization. The district owns a hospital in Palm Springs. There is so much more that we are able to do and we are doing. With our grant funding, we're able to support programs that are direct services. The Desert Healthcare District has really been a blessing to our community. We have been doing the food drive, COVID-19 testing, health fairs, AIDS testing, and Hep C testing. Before 2018, uh, the district was only able to serve half of the Coachella Valley. So Cook Street and Palm Desert was really the dividing line. So it's very important for the Desert Healthcare District to be able to uh, provide that expansion into the east end of the valley. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all looking to be healthy and to have access to that basic care that we all so desperately need. I'm grateful, you know, for the legislation that was, you know, authored by, by the Assemblyman Garcia and that opportunity now for the West and the East End to really come together and start having those very crucial conversations. Coachella Valley has extremes. We have one of the wealthiest, one of the highest income communities in the United States. And we also have rural agricultural areas where people are making probably less than minimum, minimum wage. The Desert Healthcare District was one of the first responders to the COVID-19 pandemic. We were supporting those organizations that were able to deliver healthcare because we knew that this was going to be a bigger challenge for those most vulnerable in our communities. And we were supporting those federally qualified health centers. We supported volunteers in medicine that deliver free healthcare to those that are uninsured. We wanted to make sure that everybody in the Valley had the protection. And this is why special districts and healthcare districts are so important. And I really think that we could be a model for the state of California and what it looks like when you really embrace your entire community. This last year uh, of really being a full service 
uh, district that we've already been able to see that there is more interest, there's more involvement from the residents. There is acknowledgement that their lives, their health matters. It's now my pleasure to introduce the CEO of the Desert Healthcare District, Conrado Barsaga. Thank you, Kyle. And to mention some of the things that we did not include in the video, uh, yes, we are a very diverse organization. We are, in fact, a majority main, minority uh, organization in, in our board composition. Um, three of our board members are actually children of farm workers, uh, which is an important segment of our population here in Coachella Valley. We have been evolving as a, as a healthcare district from, and that has been the result of the evolution of healthcare. Hospitals play an important role. And in 1948, they were probably the only place where people access healthcare today that happens mostly in mobile office buildings where you can get primary care, specialty care, uh, and so forth and so on. And we have been supporting our community to make sure that healthcare happens in the places where they live, where they work, where they play. Um, that has been the uh, part of the evolution of the healthcare district uh, here in Coachella Valley. One of the important things that I want to highlight is that over the last 20 years, we have allocated as a foundation approximately $80 million to make sure that those that are most vulnerable in our community receive access to health care. And uh, some examples of how we have been supporting our community include the, the response that we had to the HIV, HIV epidemic. Um, we were uh, able to help fund the Desert AIDS project. We have also been providing funding to uh, recovery and support programs for stroke cancer and substance abuse patients. We have contributed to the health insurance enrollment um, for thousands of residents uh, under the ACA. We have reduced the doctor-patient ratio by establishing or help, helping establish medical residency program here in partnership with our hospital and also with UCR. We have addressed uh, food insecurity and over the years we have funded uh, over $5 million to a local food bank. Um, we continue to support uh, children that uh, with nutrition and, and physical activity programs, we have allocated over $3 million to address homelessness in Coachella Valley. We have uh, secured also $2.5 million for behavioral health. And one of the things that we're most proud of is that earlier this year, as the country finally began to acknowledge the devastating effects of racism and its connection to public health, we created a fund to support access to health care for Black communities here in Coachella Valley. Also, one of the most important uh, and recent examples of how being nimble and being community-based is so important for a healthcare district. We were one of the first responders to the COVID-19 pandemic. We had, <clears throat> we, we had a partnership with the Department of Public Health and we have allocated uh, right now over $4 million to support an equity collaborative. And we're applying the equity lens to make sure that communities that are typically isolated that, has, that have a high, um, more difficult time accessing healthcare, that they have the, the coverage, they have the access to healthcare services that they require. Now, the expansion was something that we mentioned in, in our video. We have in fact, expanded to double the size of former districts since, since 2018. And that has come with an additional uh, challenges. We have twice the population with the same money that we used to have. And I, I think it is important that the legislature at some point will act 
to make sure that we have the resources that our community in the eastern part of Coachella Valley has the resources that are needed. We're very future um, forward looking and we're working right now on a community-based needs assessment. We're working on a community health improvement plan that will outline the needs and what the community wants from us over the next 10, 20, 30 years, this will uh, effectively uh, produce a, a change in the shape of how Coachella Valley healthcare infrastructure is going to be organized for the next 20, 30 years. And we look to you for partnership. I think we are in this together and we want to make sure that all the voices are heard and all the hands are on deck to create a very healthy, very strong healthcare infrastructure here in Coachella Valley. So thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much, Conrado. And I hope that one thing that people heard from your presentation was the word partnership, the community driven nature of the district, as well as the, the part about thinking long-term, thinking for the long haul. And I think that's a great transition to, as we pivot to mosquito abatement districts which mosquitoes may be something that people don't always uh, think about, uh, but it is certainly is something that is important to our health and wellness. And it's my pleasure to introduce our good friend and great partner, Vanessa Kahina, with the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California. Vanessa. Thank you so much, Kyle, and thank you to CSDA for the opportunity to be here on behalf of the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California. My name is Vanessa Kahina. I'm a legislative advocate with KP Public Affairs and one of our clients is the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California. We represent them on advocacy issues that affect the state's 62 member districts around the state. That goes from the top north rural part of the state all the way down to where Dr. Abatazaga just mentioned in the Coachella Valley and the southernmost tip of California. Our specific focus in terms of our advocacy is making sure that our districts within MVCAC have the resources that they need for mosquito and vector abatement to fulfill their public health responsibilities. This includes having adequate resources on tracking and surveillance to get ahead of disease spreading mosquitoes and vectors. And then also the interaction that we have with our State Department of Public Health and Department of Pesticide um, Regulations. We wanna have those cutting edge tools on surveillance and tracking so that we can get ahead of outbreaks. Um, West Nile is still a large threat in California. This is definitely a time to be mindful about public health in the state and being ahead of things as opposed to where we are, quite frankly, with the COVID pandemic. Our statewide focus is on proactive public health investments. Um, that, like I said, prevention is everything. And we are very happy to be joined by our president of the state association, who is probably happy that he's the outgoing president after a pretty wild year, Peter Bonkerud, who is also the district manager of the Shasta Mosquito and Vector Control District. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And you all are probably getting tired from all this travel, but we're gonna head back up to the top of the state and visit the Shasta Mosquito and Vector Control District. Enjoy the video. We are facing an unprecedented onslaught of new disease outbreak risks by the world's deadliest animal, the mosquito. California's mosquito control and public health response, while adequate 10 years ago, is now stretched perilously thin. Since its arrival in 2003, West Nile virus has been the most prevalent mosquito-borne disease in California. Over the past 17 years, more than 7,000 Californians have become sick from West Nile virus, and there have been more than 300 fatalities. There are no human vaccines available for this debilitating disease, and many cases of West Nile virus lead to lifelong disability. As mosquito control agencies struggle to protect Californians against West Nile virus, another mosquito threat quietly moved into our backyard. Once invasive Aedes mosquitoes invade an area, they are extremely difficult to get rid of. 
They thrive in urban environments and can lay their eggs in water sources as small as a bottle cap. They can even complete their life cycle indoors. Invasive Aedes mosquitoes are aggressive daytime biters and they can cause intense discomfort. Worse, they can spread diseases to people, including Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, and Yellow Fever. These mosquitoes were first found in California in 2011 and have spread to more than 20 counties since then. Where these mosquitoes are present, there is a risk of a local outbreak of one of these diseases. As districts work to control these mosquitoes, their costs have skyrocketed. Some districts have seen a 1,000% year-over-year increase in the number of resident service requests, which has exponentially increased the need for year-round staff. For several years, federal grants were provided to local agencies to support control of invasive aides, but these grants are no longer available. Mosquito and vector control districts need additional state funding to hire staff, purchase equipment, conduct public outreach, and develop new control strategies to fight invasive aides. Additional state funding is also needed to maintain CalServe Gateway, a statewide database used to protect public health. More than 80 mosquito and vector control districts and other public health agencies in California use CalServe for real-time data collection, visualization, and scientific analysis. This enables them to make informed decisions on interventions. Without additional funding, the future of CalServe is in jeopardy, putting public health at risk. Preparing for new disease outbreaks is key to protecting the health of Californians. Our state's mosquito control and public health response, while adequate 10 years ago, is now stretched thin. We need your help and support. Well, I often start itching after talking about these mosquitoes, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Peter Bonker, the general manager of the Shasta Mosquito and Vector Control District. Here you go, Peter. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thanks to Kyle and everyone over at CSDA for creating this platform for us to share our work. Also to thank you to everyone on the call, taking time to engage with special districts. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Peter Bonker, district manager of Shasta Mosquito and Vector Control. This year, I'm also serving as president of the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California, and we represent over 60 mosquito districts statewide. At our agency, we provide public health mosquito and vector control to 1,100 square miles and approximately 135,000 residents in Shasta County. We focus most of our efforts on surveillance and control of mosquitoes, but we also work on tick and rodent-borne disease surveillance and prevention education. So happy that CSDA included us in the protecting the health and wellness of our communities tour, because although at first glance, we may see a, seem to be a strange fit, we've always been a part of the ground level, local efforts to protect public health for our residents. We're no different than many of the special districts that you've heard from already regarding the challenges to keep our mission of protecting the public's health, while also making sure that we can keep our residents and staff safe from COVID-19, and although researchers have found that mosquitoes seem unable to transmit COVID, we do share resources like PPE with health workers on the front lines, making it harder for us to find tools that we need to continue our public health response. I think a key message uh, that we can take away from this global pandemic is the importance of improving and investing in public health and in health infrastructure before the next emerging disease arrives so that we have the tools and plans in place to react accordingly. One of those new emerging disease issues in California and unfortunately in our district in 2020 are the new invasive Aedes mosquitoes. As you saw in the video, these mosquitoes completely changed the way that we respond operationally. With West Nile virus, the sources are pretty apparent, relatively easy to find, and our surveillance and control strategies uh, are tested and proven. Uh, with invasive Aedes, we're challenged with these small cryptic sources 
that really rely heavily on property owner buy-in to effectively control. Uh, they also have the potential to transmit some pretty scary diseases that we don't currently have transmitted in California, including Zika, dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever. Um, mosquito control in our industry, we can only see that with these impacts of climate change, the stories of expanding borders for vectors and the diseases that they carry are gonna grow at a potentially exponential rate. Um, you know, we are truly the canary in the coal mine regarding climate change and, and seeing those things play out in real time uh, in our operations. So we're spending time and money trying to find new and effective ways to control uh, any new threat that's tossed our way. These novel technologies have become essential to our mission as we're always working on limited funding and labor. Things like new sterile tech insect techniques being tested in California, a prioritized focus on integrated vector management, which is an evidence-based data-driven decision-making process that finds the best tool or tools for the vector issue. And as mentioned in the video, CalServe Gateway, which is a state surveillance and modeling database uh, that we can provide oper operationally relevant information to our local public health agencies and they can respond quickly and effectively to any new and existing vector issues. Two years ago, the state provided $500,000 in desperately needed funding to keep the lights on for the developers at UC Davis. However, ongoing appropriations need to be identified as their lack of funding is jeopardizing the sustainability of this essential tool. At Shasta Mosquito and Vector Control, and as president of the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California, we truly believe our mission to protect the public's health from mosquitoes and vector-borne diseases as new challenges like COVID-19, wildfires, the impacts of climate change, have shown that training and innovation are really a key to success. And public health prioritizes those efforts that we can make proactively to prevent people from getting sick and potentially adding strain to an already strained system. You can help us uh, by working to advocate for public health issues in all of its forms, uh, mosquito control being one of those kind of uh, more odd public health related uh, forms that you might find it in and providing a friendly ear to mosquito and vector control issues and concerns. Uh, thank you to CSDA. Thank you for all the attendees, and I appreciate your time. I'll send it back to Kyle. Thank you, Peter. I know that I am grateful to have specialists like you looking out for us on an issue that I might, I might otherwise overlook. And with that, uh, we've concluded the tour throughout the state of special districts, but we are just now opening up the opportunity for questions and answers. I know we've had at least one question come in. If others have questions, this is your chance to hear it from the experts. Please feel free to chat your questions in through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And you can just start typing those in now and I'll get to as many as I can within our remaining time. While we're taking those questions, if you wouldn't mind filling out our very brief two question post two tour poll, uh, there's two questions. So just answer the first one, scroll down and answer the second and submit and we will have that and we appreciate it. Our first question, uh, is for Valerie from Mayor's Memorial Hospital District. And Valerie, you mentioned the 2030 seismic retrofit requirement and the impact that that had on your district. Can you please share for those that may not know uh, what that requirement is, what it is, and how it's affected your district and other healthcare and hospital agencies throughout the state? Thank you. Okay, I'll try to keep it simple because it's a pretty complicated thing, but we just had to meet the, the 2020 requirements to have our, um, there's just different SPC codes and NPC codes and that gets kind of complicated, but we were able to complete um, the portion of our hospital that was non-compliant, a building that was built in 1956. So we moved our emergency imaging lab, as you saw in the video, that project in itself um, took many, many years and probably longer than it should have. We should have opened that in 2019 to meet the January 1 requirement. We had to file an extension and we opened in August of 2020. So in looking at the 2030 requirements, when we have to move some of our other services retrofit into a seismically compliant space, um, time and money, that's what it comes down to. And I know that's an issue for everyone, but when you look um, at a smaller rural standalone hospital, it's a little bit more complicated. You know, the time factor, I, I was able to express that with our, our last project. And one of the reasons for that is just getting skilled and qualified contractors that 
are OSHPOT approved that can come and do our project number one. And then with the different things that have happened in our state, like wildfires and rebuilding entire communities, contractors basically can pick and choose the, the jobs that they want to take. So we had a really hard time the first time around. And then the other thing is just financially. It's a big impact on us to look at having to retrofit pretty much our the rest of our entire building. Um, and with the strains of COVID and the different things that have been happening over the last year, the 2030 requirements look to be pretty challenging for us and most other rural districts. If I may, I, Kyle, uh, this is a challenge that all healthcare districts are facing. Uh, we have a very large hospital for a region. We have a 378 beds and retrofitting the hospital is estimated to cost between 120 and 180 million dollars. That is a huge uh, undertaking for any community hospital and we cannot do this without the help from uh, from from our state. It's it's almost impossible to undertake 180 million. And it's putting at risk many community hospitals uh, unless we find uh, some solution over the next uh, 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Conrado and Valerie. A follow-up question that we received on the topic of the seismic retrofits is, uh, are either of you or perhaps Amber at ACHD aware of any opportunities to leverage uh, hazard mitigation funding from OES or Cal OES, et cetera, to use for that sort of an opportunity? Um, I'm not as familiar with those funds that Cole is asking about. Um, however, healthcare districts are using all available funding options that are out there for them. Um, districts that are in rural areas similar to mayors have been able to take advantage of USDA HUD loans and that is uh, that funds 90% of the project the district then has to make up the other 10%. Those are only available to particular facilities that meet the qualifications. So if you're a larger facility similar to um, desert facility would not be eligible for the USDA HUD loans. So um, up to this point, the state has not had any conversations on um, the seismic mandate in terms of funding opportunities for these facilities. So that remains a large challenge as well as um, all of the challenges that Valerie and uh, Conrado spoke about. Um, the OSHPOD challenges are fairly great in terms of the time constraints as well as making sure that you have the skilled, the skilled workforce in those communities. And as these facilities start to uh, ramp up for the 2030, those uh, resources are going to be uh, much more challenging to um, get in their communities. So this is a big issue. It is something ACHD will be working on in the coming years, as well as um, obviously larger associations as well that represent health, um, healthcare entities and hospitals. Thank you, Amber. Uh, next question is for Peter from the Shasta Mosquito and Vector Control District. And Peter, uh, it struck me that uh, the, uh, the need for mosquito abatement and vector control, you sort of don't realize the need for it until you have a problem. And yet it's, as we've seen with COVID, these sorts of epidemics, it's not exactly easy to play catch up once it's taken root and gotten going. Um, you also, so I'd, I'd love to hear from you about from a, from a financial sustainability standpoint of how mosquito abatement districts are doing right now um, in preparation for the next emergency, as well as at the state level, you'd reference some resources. I believe it was a database type tool that used to be funded through the UC system. Can you maybe talk about that, how much that is and what the value of it is? Thank you. Sure. So I think in general, um, you know, we're still waiting to see exactly what impact COVID is going to have on most of our uh, revenues. You know, largely mosquito and vector control districts are property tax funded. Um, and so the, 
the jury's still out as to exactly where that ball's going to land um, when everything starts to settle. But I think even previous to the pandemic, we were stretched pretty thin. You know, I think uh, public health tends to be one of those things that people fund in waves. So if there's a concern, if there's an issue that's um, known and is getting a lot of attention, often money becomes available, but then uh, it, it wanes pretty quickly um, when those issues are resolved or at least worked on. Um, and really public health needs that consistent infrastructure support so that we can continue to build out our, our surveillance strategies, our response strategies, so that you know, we don't have to ramp up these huge um, you know, buy-ins from, from, from an infrastructure standpoint when we roll into whatever the new emerging disease is. Um, you know, we did get some, uh, some support during West Nile virus when it first hit California. We did get some support when uh, Zika was a concern in California, still a concern, but um, it just, it's, it's, it's never enough. And now what we're seeing is those funding sources are going away and the problems still exist. And we're having to deal with them, you know, uh, with local tax base, with local response, um, because we're seeing a spread. We're seeing the writing on the wall, you know, as I mentioned, the canary in the cave, we are, we're seeing it and we're seeing it getting worse. Um, so I think that from a general standpoint as a concern, you know, we're being asked to do more with less, which is probably everybody's story, but it just definitely feels that way. Um, and, and I think, you know, we continue to try to find in, innovative ways to, to be efficient so that we can try to match those needs, um, but it does become challenging. And one of those innovative needs is that CalServe gateway that I discussed. So it was actually created back in uh, West Nile virus time under some funding that was available. And then it's been kind of sustained through a mixture of grants through UC Davis, um, some other federal monies, as well as Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California um, has been financially supporting the database in spurts as well. Um, that database, that modeling set is, is really an essential tool piece for our operational, local operational response. So it's tracking all of our mosquito surveillance information, all of our disease surveillance information, um, all of our uh, pesticide applications, all of our resistance testing information. And it's bringing all that information together uh, with some really smart people with a lot of letters after their name that then are able to kind of give us operationally relevant information um, and we can then respond at a local level. I, not much money. I mean, we need around $500,000 annually to keep the programmers moving um, and we're really struggling. Obviously, timing was pretty bad in, in terms of COVID and, and where we are uh, in terms of funding availability. We were able to get CalServe codified as part of our, our health and safety code element. So at least the wording's in our health and safety code. Now we just need to be able to fund that um, in, a, in a more sustainable way. So it's $500,000 and it's fundamental to basically mosquito abatement throughout the state. Correct. And I would say not just mosquito abatement, but uh, California Department of Public Health utilizes it, um, you know, local health agencies, you know, so environmental health, whatever that response looks like, um, you know, in their locality, it's, it's essential. It's, it's a, and the public facing tool is also being worked on. So I think um, already people can go access a lot of that information as, as just uh, Joe Q public and can see what's going on at a statewide level or even at a very local level. And, and I only see those tool sets being uh, more developed and more helpful to the communities uh, where we're doing our work. Thank you, Peter. We're going to shift to our final question. And this is a question for each of our presenters. And I will start with Valerie, move to Conrado, and then finish with Peter. And the question is uh, a very generous question from one of our attendees asked, essentially, what can the state legislature do to help? Uh, so if you wouldn't mind making this your closing statement, and it's part of your closing statement answering that question, uh, after your answers, we'll go ahead and conclude the tour. Uh, take it away, please, Valerie. I think the, the best thing that the legislator can do for us is just to be accessible and to communicate with us and to you know listen to the things that we're dealing with. And we have had a really great relationship with the legislator and a lot of members. Um, and, and I think that coming this, this year ahead of us, there's some things that are important to us and other healthcare districts. And those would be 
like access to providers, um, telehealth type of legislation that's out there, we need to really look at how we can provide the best possible care to our small communities in these districts. So communication, collaboration, and the willingness like you all are here today listening to what we're about, we really, really appreciate that because we appreciate being able to bring forward our concerns and the different challenges that as districts we face. So thank you so much for being here today. I think for, for us looking at um, how optimistic we are about the future of the Desert Healthcare District and the population here in Coachella Valley, the biggest challenge we have has been in 2018, we were expanded and we're very proud of that expansion. We appreciate the work that assembly member Eduardo Garcia, who has been a champion and a true leader here in our community to expand that, our district. Now we have more than double the size of the district that now has a significant healthcare needs. And we're working to build that infrastructure of the future to provide access to healthcare for a very large number of residents here in our district that didn't have access to healthcare and some remain without access to healthcare or have many challenges. The expansion came with a large number of people, a huge geographic uh, undertaking, but with the same tax base. So we're, all our revenues are coming from the west side of the valley and nothing from the eastern side of the valley where most of our residents reside. And that probably needs an act of the legislature. So thank you. Well, I guess the benefit of going last is I get to echo a lot of what already has been said. You know, obviously um, the collaboration, just being no, know, know, being knowledgeable of what we're doing and and how you can help us. Um, getting to know your local uh, special district is essential. Local special districts, plural. Um, you know, from mosquito and vector control. You know, I think. Those two elements are going to be our focus in in the on, distant or near future. I'm sorry. So CalSERV funding. So trying to find some way to sustainably fund that program um, so that we have the tools we need. And then those invasive 80s issues are going to continue to grow. We're seeing them. We added, I think, six to seven counties just in 2020. Um, we don't have the infrastructure to support uh, an entirely new species and an entirely new slate of diseases. Um, and the districts that have been dealing with them now for six to eight years have had to build out entirely new programs to support it with no additional funding. And it's, um, it, it's challenging for large districts. It's even more challenging for small districts. I have a 15 man operation um, and I'm not entirely sure how we'll be able to respond in 2021 to our invasive 80s fine that we had here in 2020. Thank you so much to our presenters, to our host districts. These are just three of the 2000 independent special districts throughout the state. I hope that all of you attending have the opportunity to visit more of them, not just virtually, but in person one day. I also wanna thank our partners, the Association of California Healthcare Districts and the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California. And most importantly, thank you to the partnership with the state legislature, with Congress, and with all of you that were able to participate today. Please don't hesitate to follow up with us. If CSDA can't answer your question, we've got a lot of specialists out there in your community and we'll get you connected. With that, have a great day and stay healthy and happy holidays.